Hello everyone, my name is Willie Eaglehawk and I am the BTS Theorist. On today's podcast, I want to take you on a little journey of what I'm calling the emo music to BTS pipeline. This is a pipeline that I have been on, I believe, for the past, I don't know, 18 years or so. And it's one that I have been thinking about in recent weeks in particular. Okay, so I'll take you to the very start and then you know, we can build our way back from there because I have a few ideas about essentially the emo music to BTS pipeline is very real. It's something that I've seen within myself and it's something that I've seen throughout the fandom where when we were younger, we listened to emo music and now we listen to BTS. So how is this the case? Are there any commonalities? Are there any key themes arising? Like, how did we go from listening to emo music to listening to BTS? That's what I want to know. And I have a pretty good idea of how that happened. So the story goes, the other week I went to see The Used. Now, The Used were my favourite band when I was about 12. That's when I first heard them. So I was in my final year of primary school, about to go into high school. Uh, My first time changing schools, everything was very intense and weird and strange and I absolutely hated it. So when I found the used, I was transfixed. I was transported. They totally changed my life and they completely shaped me um, in those formative years, you know, going from 12 to 13, from primary school to high school. That's where a lot of like who I am now was originally shaped and built, which is very interesting to think. The Used are an emo band. And when I saw them the other week, they even said so. Like Bert came out on stage, the lead singer, and was like, we are the fucking Used (laughs) and we are the, the best emo band in the world. And it's true, like they are emo. And when I was 12, 13, 14, emo was used as like a derogatory term. Emo was something that was really looked down upon by so many people. And yet it's what I identified as, but it's also a label that I rejected because it made me, you know, an outcast. And that's what people believe me with. So my name is Walia, um, as you may already know, and people called me (laughs) Walimo. which now I find like pretty funny. Um, It's a very clever play on words. But back then, like people were jeering me with it. People were throwing food at me, um, trying to hurt me, telling me to go kill myself. Um, And for a young person, that is, I mean, for anyone, that's intense, but especially a young person uh, because I had never experienced this kind of negative, violent hateful behavior before in my life yet the use were there for me that whole time um the interesting thing about the use is that they come from utah a place that is heavily uh mormon and a lot of their music has this undertone of like get me the fuck out of here get me out of this small town um i just want to be free of all of this i just want to be myself um and I think for me growing up in Western Australia in a place called Bunbury which is one of the more isolated parts of the world believe it or not um Perth is two hours north of Bunbury that's the capital city of the state and it is one of the most isolated cities in the world in comparison to other cities and per capita um and from my American family's point of view, they when my dad moved from America to Australia and to Bunbury, um, my grandfather got out a map and figured out that Bunbury was the furthest most point in the entire world that my father could have moved from his family home. So yeah, it's isolated. And for me, it felt like a cultural purgatory. And this was around the time that like MySpace was really big. Um, The internet was kind of just popping off. YouTube was like fledgling. Uh, LimeWire was where I got all of my music. And this was my connection to the outside world. So because I was so into MySpace culture, 
where everyone was emo and seen and they were doing what spam for spam and whore for whore. Um, If you don't know what those terms are, definitely look them up. (laughs) It might not be what you think. Um, But because of that, I was able to connect with people from all around the world. So I was talking to people in America, I was talking to people on the east coast of Australia and people also quite a lot older than me. And that's how I got introduced to emo music because there was no way in hell I was going to accidentally stumble across it in my town of Bunbury. Um, yeah, so that's that's how I first got into it. I was 12. I remember the guy I was talking to on the internet from the east coast of Australia. He was into the used. Um, I started listening to them, fell in love, and they were there with me through that really difficult time in my childhood. And their music gave me a way of understanding my own emotions um, and expressing myself and shaping my identity and kind of through observing the U's and then My Chemical Romance and also from First to Last and Fall Out Boy and Panic at the Disco and all those kinds of bands, I realized that I could create myself into anything. Like here were these men, interestingly enough, all of these men who were dressed very differently to me, expressing themselves however they wanted, tattoos, piercings, weird hairstyles, um, like this real punk mentality. And it was my first time being around this and I loved it um, because already in school I was pushing back against the system. I was a great student, very bright, but I refused to be complicit in anything I felt was unfair or unjust. And that was mostly in the way that teachers would treat students so I would just not comply and teachers found this quite upsetting because I wasn't acting in any way that would really get me in trouble but I also wasn't playing along with whatever they were trying to do and I saw some some horrible situations between students and teachers where teachers were acting completely inappropriately And I just refused to be part of that. Um, I would often refuse to do tests, refuse to participate if I felt things were not fair. So this real fuck the system kind of mentality that all this emo music had while being incredibly emotional and expressive um, was everything to me. So anyway, here I was just a few weeks ago, April 30, um, I knew the used were coming to town. They were doing like a double headline with Papa Roach and I never really knew Papa Roach. I know them now because of um, the song on TikTok, you know, cut my heart into pieces. Uh, But before that, I never really knew them Uh, and it had sold out. I had just been to see the 1975. I was just recovering from influenza and I was like, oh, it's just not the right time. Um, they were a band, of course, I really loved them. I saw them maybe seven years ago. It's okay. Like I've seen them plenty of times. I don't need to go. And then the closer and closer I got to going to this, uh, this event happening, I was like, oh no, I I have to go. Like, it feels really important to me that I go to this event. So I camped out on the ticketing page and refreshed it and refreshed it until someone put their tickets up for sale. And I got tickets the night before the show. I went down there and um, somehow made my way to the very front. I arrived late, missed everything and got there like right before the used were set to perform and everyone went outside for a smoke. I walked towards the front and suddenly I was at the barricade looking up at the stage. It was a bit of an awkward position, but that's why no one was there, right? And suddenly I was there and um, this was the closest I've ever been, like, wow, I've never been this close to the use before. So the lights go down and the use come out and I start crying. (laughs) I was not expecting to start crying. They started with a song called Take It Away. And um, this is a song that they, you know, have always started with. Everything that I watched when I was 12, 13, 14, all of their shows started with this song. So for it to come on at this time, 18 years later, I was like, holy shit. Like, I love them so much. And listen to my voice. I don't know if you can hear, but I just, I started getting emotional. So I'm going to try not to think too much about that moment. Um, But in that moment, I was like, oh my goodness, I am still the same person I was all those years ago. 
in fact, I'm the exact same person. I'm looking at um at the clock right now and it's 11.22. <laughs> and um, yeah, and that's one, two, one, two. I was I was 12 when who I am today really started taking root. And I consciously and subconsciously started forming who I was. And it was all thanks to the used. Um, and I haven't changed from that person. I've just grown and evolved. And that was a very profound moment um, to realize that I have not strayed. I have not um, become a totally different person since becoming an adult. No, I I am the same. And so it was a very profound moment because all of those emotions came back. Um, everything that I, I wanted for myself as a 12-year-old, I was reminded of, and I realized that I am living that life right now. Man, it was intense. So here I was crying, filming, <laughs> and Bert, the lead singer. Um, so I'm kind of like standing to the very end of the stage, right? And so Bert's standing facing out, looking at the crowd. And then within the first few lines, he completely turns his back to most people and looks directly at me and sings most of the song and then most of the set looking right at me. So here I am filming, crying, and then getting lash glue in my eyes to the point where I am now in like agony. If anyone has ever had lash glue in their eyes, you will know it really, really hurts. And it really makes things um, difficult. It makes seeing very difficult because you've got to literally like go in there and get the lash glue out of your eyes. So I'm like looking very funny. Like my eyes are fully like squinting, um, crying, but like also screaming the words out while filming. Um, and he's looking at me and I'm looking at him. And, uh, it was the best night of my life. Absolutely. I couldn't get to see BTS in Busan, even though I was in Busan and tried to get tickets. Um, I went to the live play. I saw them on a screen. It felt very strange, but I wasn't, I wasn't actually physically there. And then the same thing for the 1975, which were another huge influence on me. Finally got tickets to see them um, get to the venue. And it's like one of those sloping amphitheater venues. So technically you should be able to stand anywhere and see, but for some reason, everyone that night was incredibly tall and I couldn't see the stage. So I thought that was kind of funny. It was like, okay, I went to see the used, um, and actually could, could see them, could actually literally see them. And they were looking at me and I was looking at them. Whoa. Anyway, it was a spiritual moment. So that was a bit of a preamble, like a 15 minute preamble. I apologize. What I wanted to talk about from that is like, how the fuck did I go from listening to the used to listening to BTS? So essentially my music timeline went the used. And of course, within that panic at the disco, like loved them. Um, My Chemical Romance, of course. And then another band called From First to Last. I also like Fall Out Boy, but I didn't get into them as much as everyone else. Um, And then from there, I went into like more hardcore then I went into more like post-hardcore. So my pivotal bands are The Use when I was 12, Enter Shikari when I was about 18. And then a few years later or around the same time, the 1975. And then when I was 25, 26, BTS. So I went emo, post-hardcore, whatever the 1975 are, what indie rock, a um, bit of country, a bit of everything, a bit of pop, and then BTS, who are just sitting over here as this completely different, um, well, they're not even K-pop, but let's just say K-pop because we we know what BTS sounds like. Rap, hip-hop, pop, K-pop, EDM, you name it you know, even a bit of rock, that's BTS. So to me, it didn't make a lot of sense. When I first became a fan of BTS, I was like, why do I like BTS so much? Because everything else I listen to is either punk or hip hop. Like it doesn't really compute to me because BTS are kind of the antithesis of the anti-establishment stuff that I am consuming. And of course, that is the main theme throughout all of the music that I like. It's high intensity, 
um, strong kind of counterculture, anti-establishment, and, of course, it just sounds really good. So when I first saw BTS, I was like, how does this fit into the picture? So that's what I really wanted to explore in this podcast today. Like, how did I go from the use to BTS? The emo music to BTS pipeline. I know we've experienced it. A lot of us have experienced it. I've just done a post on Instagram where a lot of people are saying, yes, this is me and it's still me because, of course, emo is not a phase, mum. So the first point that I really want to touch on is like, how do we, how did we get from listening to emo music to loving BTS? Emo music and BTS have in common very, very strong identities. Visual identity, music identity, lyric identity, who they are as people, who is they, who they are as performers, like their identity is so strong and their expression of identity is what makes them who they are. It's some of the first things that we consume from them is their identity because we're looking at videos and we're like, oh my goodness, they're wearing these clothes, their hair looks like this, they're dancing like this, their music video is put together like that. It's a very strong expression of identity, though the identities may be sitting at different ends of a spectrum and identity is not fixed, it's rather fluid anyway. Both emo bands and BTS are very strong in this expression. It's not mediocre, like you could name so many different pop acts right now that have very mediocre expressions of identity, even when they're, you know, trying to be something like, think, Harry Styles, um, because I also had a One Direction phase, let's not get into that though, but like, you know how he wears all of those jumpsuits and all the sparkles and the ruffles. Like you would think that that's, that's his attempt at an identity and that's how he wants to express himself. Of course, that's not an attempt, but that is how he wants to express himself. But it doesn't come across as like a strong, like, sense you around, grab you by the balls kind of identity. No, it's, it's a different kind of identity, a softer identity. Although it's very, like, complete in how it's presented, it's not like an in-your-face, this is who I am, fuck you, fuck the system kind of thing. <laughs> So that's that's the first thing that I was really drawn to and it was it was interesting because last year I was getting coached by a business mentor and she was really curious to know about my work, what I write about. And so I talked about BTS and how I'm really like one of my main schools of thought that I absolutely love is talking about identity, like identity theory. Oh, it really gets me going. And so we explored that and we went back to the used and she said to me, um, don't you think it's interesting that, because at this point in my life, I had almost lost my identity last, at the end of last year, I was feeling very disconnected from everything. And she said, don't you think it's interesting that your main passion in life um, is BTS and it was the used and all these musicians that have very, very strong identities. And that that's what you're so interested in. You're writing about it. You're publishing books about it. And it's also what you've you've lost as well is that connection to your own identity. So perhaps one of the reasons why you love them so much is because they are so strong in their identity and it helps you be stronger in your identity um, and helps you know who you are. And I was like, well, coach lady, you are very correct. <laughs> um, so I, I think that's definitely like a huge commonality between the two something else that I think is no mistake is that all of the music and I've had this conversation with people in my life before all of the music that I listen to well 99% of it is by men and so the used were a bunch of guys BTS are a bunch of guys And they are very masculine in their own ways. Like these are very different. They show very different um, expressions of masculinity at times because also masculinity, like, you know, that's kind of a social construct in itself, isn't it? So you get to decide, you know, they get to decide how they want to express it. There's no one way or another. But it is very masculine as opposed to feminine, which is what, you know, my whole world has been dominated by single mum, only having really like girls as friends. really, you know, wanting connection with other guys in my life um, and my dad, you know, really craving that male connection. 
to help ground me from all this like feminine energy that I got going on. So I think it's no mistake that what I find very appealing about emo music and BTS is that it's men expressing their identities, expressing their emotions, expressing their artistry and being amazing performers and artists. Because I already got this female thing on lock. Like that's me, that's my, even though gender is a social construct, etc., it's still my experience of the world. It's still my social conditioning. So I got that locked down. But being able to understand and see and experience men having very complex emotions and expressing themselves and being very kind and caring to one another and their fans and everyone around them is incredibly healing. Um, And it really, yeah, it's just something that I was very attracted to from a very young age. So I think it's no mistake like that emo music is heavily dominated by men and that BTS are a group of men with their primary um, demographic being women. Of course, ARMY are very diverse. Um, I don't want to say that it's just women, but, you know, a very large number of BTS's fans do identify as female. And that's no mistake. If there's something very healing about men doing the work that BTS are doing. So I touched on it just then, but what I really want to drive home is the emotional complexity in the in the work of emo music and BTS is profound. Emo music, emo literally means emotional, right? Which is why people get so, you know, tied up over it. They get their panties in a twist because it's emotional. Like what is wrong with having emotions? Why was I bullied for having emotions and liking emo music and expressing myself like that? Why are people so afraid? Um, and BTS, BTS display such complex emotion through their lyricism, through how their songs are arranged, how they perform them, their stages, all of their content. They are multidimensional human beings, right? We all are, and they are showing such a wide range of emotional complexity and expressing it in such beautiful and artistic ways. And that's, that's so attractive. That's so healing. And that's something that I can really resonate with because, hey, I feel the same way. Even if I haven't experienced the exact same things that BTS are talking about or the U's are talking about or insert emo band name here are talking about, I can relate to that because I can feel like the, the genuine raw energy behind it. And I really appreciate and respect that as a fellow human being. It's good to know that there are other people out there uh, feeling this way and having these conversations and writing these lyrics. And it's so important that it's men doing this work. Interestingly, I believe that BTS are punk. And the reason I say this is because punk is a mentality, right? It's not a sound. Although we we think punk and we think punk rock and we think people with those, you know, massive mohawks and we think like the Sex Pistols and all of this stuff. But punk is is a frame of mind, right? And it's anti-establishment. And BTS started off very, very strongly anti-establishment. Like listen to their first album, please, and read the lyrics and understand what they're thinking about and talking about. Think about no... Um, think about even more recent songs I know like All Day on RM's album Indigo with Tableau, think about All Day, think about even D-Day, Augustine Sugar's latest release, like the anti-feudalism, the feudalism stuff that he's talking about in uh, yeah, his music, like, well, sorry, my brain is just like popping off with examples right now, but think about Go Go. Um, you know, like just just think about the critiques that are woven throughout BTS's music. That is punk. They were outside of the system. They were trainees. They were trying so hard to become successful idols. And now just because they are doesn't mean that they can't critique the system. Life is very complex. Capitalism is dominating all of us and we are all complicit in one way or another. And BTS are not outside of that. They're right in the middle of it. They're right, not, not at the top, 
they're somewhere around the middle and we're all a bit like lower down depending who's listening of course but it doesn't mean that they're not suffering it doesn't mean that they can't see what's happening it doesn't mean that they're not negotiating the complexities of capitalism and racism and colonialism and all the isms every day and that's still seen throughout their work and their music and how they interact with people and what they're doing in the world and that's something that the youths were doing way back when that's something that all those emo bands were doing they were saying fuck you fuck you man fuck the system because they were what most of these bands came out of poverty. Most of these bands were in the middle of nowhere, like the used in Utah. And they really had to struggle and work hard to get somewhere. And that's what they have in common with BTS. And that's the, that's the mindset and the energy and the sentiment that I absolutely love. I think about Enter Shikari, still one of my favorite bands, and their, their messages are so political so like so outwardly political and that is one of the main reasons why I love them so much and the fact that they're able to put these incredibly political messages with music that literally like the way that it sounds is like let's stand up and fight for this world and fuck the system and fuck you you know um and then in the 1975 I'm thinking about the lyrics that they write and Matty Healy is always talking about postmodernism. Um, you know, it, these are all, this is all political commentary and BTS have it too. And I think we can sometimes forget this because their lyrics are in Korean. And if you're, you know, um, native English speaker, not fluent in Korean, like me, and you're listening to this, you, you might have the same experience where it's like, even if you read the lyrics, you're like, yep, I understand this song is about this. But over time, when you listen to the song, because you're not hearing those English words, you're then not necessarily thinking about the meaning of the song. Whereas if you were listening to it, and all the lyrics were in English and they were saying, you know, fuck the system, etc. You'd be like, yeah, fuck the system. But think about like, go, go. I love that song. And the way that they perform it live is very playful, very cheerful. Um, but those are not the lyrics. Like, <laughs> and I think we can forget that. I think we can forget that um, and just not be, you know, as susceptible to absorbing the message because of the, the language difference. But it's there. And it's throughout all of BTS's work, even though they they are so much, as I write in Idol Limerence 2020, the smiling face of capitalism, they are. But it doesn't mean that they can't critique the system. It doesn't mean that they're not also losing in this system like we all are as well. So that's, yeah, that's what I think is like the one of the biggest links between emo music and BTS is that they're both punk and they're both anti-establishment in their own ways. Further to this, emo music and BTS, they're both outsiders. They both sit on the periphery of what is accepted as normal and right. Emo music is like, oh, you're emotional. You like to listen to people like screaming and being like, oh, I hate my life. And, you know, lyrics that discuss alcoholism, drug use, self-harm, um, suicidal ideation, all of that stuff. Well, hello. Firstly, welcome to the real world. That is what is going on and then bts people are like oh they look like girls firstly rude secondly double rude like it's rude no matter which way you look at it um and secondly oh it's pop music therefore it doesn't have any depth oh it's mass made therefore it's made for all the people and music that's made for everyone surely isn't highbrow or it's you know it's very kind of cringy to listen to mass made music what even is mass made music by the way like truly <laughs> what is that it? it's not like a car factory <laughs> they still they still record music in the same way still gets distributed in the same way it's just that it's consumed on mass right and people will freak out about it and think that's a negative oh bts are korean like i could i could go on of all the reasons why people especially in the west of course i'm speaking from a very western perspective are like oh bts and they sit on the outside. Like we've seen over the years how hard it has been for them to crack the American market. They still haven't got a Grammy, though their success is far greater than the vast majority of people who win these Grammys over BTS or even nom or nominated over BTS. So they're still sitting on the periphery, even though they've, by all means, they've made it 
they're, they're really huge and actually they're getting bigger and bigger every passing day. They still exist on the periphery and their fandom as such exists on the periphery even though we are so vast and large and powerful. The same goes for emo music. It was on the periphery then and it's on the periphery now. But this is their power spot. They wouldn't be as good if they were 100% mainstream because we get our power as fans because we are also feeling like we're on the periphery and nobody else understands us. We get our power from connecting to the music that is also made from the periphery and about being on the periphery and also from connecting to other fans who are also feeling the same way. And through that, we are able to create very strong fandom, very strong community and a counterculture, a subculture. And you can see that very clearly with emo, emo slash scene, and then eventually like merged into hipster. Um, hey, I went on that. I went on that journey. I'm, and then I went to indie right after. I'm pretty sure a lot of us went through that. And now here I am, BTS Army. Um, it's all on the periphery. And that's the power. And that is why ARMY is so powerful as well, because we we feel like the underdogs. And BTS most definitely started off as the underdog. And we and we love that stuff. And in Australia, it's such a part of our culture. It's called the Aussie Battler. Um, which is kind of a weird way to glorify, you know, capitalism shafting us. But anyway, it's that it is that underdog mentality that we have here and we celebrate it. It's like you you down, you get kicked, you get back up, you try again and you try again and you try again. And culturally, we love that stuff. And I I know in Korea as well, they they love a good like underdog story. Um because they're of course a nation that did get kicked and they were down um and they have had to come back and so like I think everyone just really loves that they love a good underdog story and BTS were an underdog and in their fight now to still you know kind of get recognized in the west they are very much the underdog still though it's changing it is changing so I think that's that's another thing it's kind of like we were primed listening to emo music, being in this counterculture, this movement, being anti-establishment, um, being like having to stick together as part of the emo community. We were primed then to become ARMY because it's, it's the same thing. It's the same passion and enthusiasm and commitment and understanding and shared philosophy and language and expression of identity and emotions and culture and all of these things. It's the same. That's why it's a pipeline. Um, it's not a pipe system where you, you know, you start off here in emo and you go over here into this other pipe down here into BTS. No, it's like it's the one pipe. It is a slippery slope, my friends, and I I will be the first to admit that I have been on that pipeline and in that slope and, whoa, mixing my metaphors, but I hope you understand what I mean. So I think I have made my point. <laughs> I hope I have made my point that there are some some huge commonalities between emo music and BTS. It's the fans, it's the culture, it's men expressing complex emotions. It's being on the periphery, both the musicians and the fans. It's being culturally on the outside. It's about being anti-establishment, being punk. It's about masculinities and identities and just the beauty of life. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting deep in my feelings right now, but truly, like, emo music is about emotions. BTS's music is about emotions and it's about identity and it's about life and the beauty of life and the pain of life. And that is that is what the two have in common. And I believe that I've been on that pipeline and I think a lot more people have been on that pipeline or are still on that pipeline where, you know, still listening to emo music. I still listen to emo music. I listen to so many different genres of music now, but I'm always true to my roots. And who I was as a 12-year-old would be so, so pleased uh, with BTS. Like, can you imagine having found BTS as a 12-year-old? And I know there are people out there right now who are very young finding BTS, but that is that is truly magical. And I had that magic with the used back when MySpace was a thing and they did this weird live streaming on a, I'm going to have to find the website. It probably doesn't exist anymore, but the used used to go on and do like 
live streaming on a website where you could chat to them and they would sit there and they would just chat for hours and I would talk to them as a 12, 13, 14 year old. Um, And that level of fan service as well is something, you know, that BTS do as well, building that parasocial connection. Um, Anyway, I don't want to go down that, that rabbit hole. Now there's a slippery slope. Yes. Okay. Don't mix your metaphors. All right. My point is I love emo music and I love BTS and it's so interesting to trace these commonalities and these themes and these currents from here, I'm about to turn 30, back to when I was 12 and to see that I am the exact same person and I like the exact same things. They've just taken different shapes and different forms, just like I've taken a different shape and a different form even though it's the same body. Um, It's just different iterations of the same thing over and over, right? And is that not life in a nutshell? So that brings us to the end of this podcast. I hope you have enjoyed listening to me ramble. I wanted to quickly give a shout out to my books. I am putting up on pre-order right now. I am ARMY. It's time to begin, which is the first ever ARMY book I edited and put together back in 2020. I have just released um, or I'm about to release the second edition. So it has a beautiful new cover. If you're watching on video, you can see it sitting here over my shoulder. It matches the cover of I Am Army, We Don't Need Permission, which is the second book that recently came out as well. Pre-order is up. It's coming out May 26. You can buy it by itself. You can get an ebook. We can get it in a two pack with its matching sister. Um, anyway, just check the book out. It's a wonderful collection of army stories that people have cherished all around the world and I love it so much and I'm really excited for you all to see the new cover and to, you know, have it on display in your house just like I have. (laughs) Okay, you can find me online at the BTS Theorist on Instagram and Willie Eaglehawk on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, etc. Clapper apparently is a thing now, but um, yeah, we'll see. Jury's still out. Anyway, I will see you next time. Bye.